Hello everyone, today we talk again about communal civilization and I know many of you prefer bloodsheds and massacres and I do as well, so I understand you perfectly when it comes to military history um, that these topics are a bit mm, like and I realize <coughs> even from the stats that th these are not excessively appreciated something I said too often at this point but um, this is still a part of a process that we will get over with uh, at one point basically I address this broader let's say, historical topics wh for what it concerns medieval history, maybe we'll, one day we will pass to the modern one, the contemporary one, um, and the ancient also, but that are aimed to give a 360 degree uh, perspective on, on the period, and and actually uh, how it turns out most of the times, th these topics are really interesting, I mean, I don't understand much. I'm, I'm not a sociologist, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, definitely not even a uh, historian of of society or, or economics, but um, as we know from our uh, read of von Clausewitz, we cannot understand even what we like the most in terms of military history without knowing political and social history, because it's really all about this. Um, and relatively to the topic, communal history, and on this instead I'm rather sympathetic to, to, to the message. I uh, I think it's one of the uh, most overlooked topics uh, in any possible, in imaginable way. I mean, we already know the Middle Ages are kind of, people don't care about it. At, at least I take it from, from a Western European or even North American perspective. Um, mm, there are certain aspects definitely of, of medieval history that are interesting, but they're confined to to certain historiographical traditions, or maybe even certain popular, um, <coughs> you know, um, re rep representations that take movies or video games. Um, but there are many, many topics that are left out. And w what I'm trying to do on Schwerpunkt, actually, very, very, uh, you know, humbly, the high hope at least, is to try progressively to to fill this gap. I mean, to to talk about things that effectively are not discussed and, and I'm pretty proud to see that if you search like I'm doing right now communal um, communal um, let's say you say communes medieval communes you realize that most of in here on face on um, excuse me on YouTube um, the only videos that pop out are mines and, and, and I and I'm pretty pretty satisfied about this and someone watches them Interestingly enough, I don't know why <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to know, but um, it's it's one of those overlooked topics because fundamentally, uh, it um, I mean communal Europe is um, it doesn't encompass really the the majority of Europe. Let, let's be honest uh, about this. It's, it's only certain areas that lived uh, more intensely. Let's say the communal phenomenon had. A part of the, the foundation, even of uh, at least in part of the modern national identities on it, um, <coughs> but uh, we definitely cannot ignore it for what it, mm, for example, what it concerns um, the, the birth of um, modern Europe, broadly meant, chiefly the Renaissance, and because it started really from there. And uh, this is a broader topic actually that embraces. Uh, really, the develop the urban development of, of of the medieval world that is usually overlooked in the sense that you know yeah we, yeah we know that in all pre-industrial societies, majority of the people lived in the countryside, and therefore we like the idea, or at least it's a kind of a uh, easy and cheap sometimes and even lazy way to say okay well the Middle Ages is all about peasantry and the countryside and uh, you know uh, feudalism rurally meant I mean the castle in the center of the countryside and that's pretty much it but that's really taking in fact away a, a solid chunk of of European history of, of during the Middle Ages um, but also taking away basically uh, much of the sap actually that made the continent at the time um, starting to 
you know, to, to speed it up and to, to accelerate, to, to expand and to grow. Because really the cities were extremely important in medieval civilizations, much more actually than in the ancient world. In the ancient world, what you see is the great empires like, like Rome, for example, talking chiefly about this European dimension, uh, where, I mean, they did obviously gravitate around cities, but it was a kind of a more, um, let's say, um, it, it was a system that had way less potential than the medieval one. Um, as we know, eventually that model, that ancient model, kind of, uh, if, if not collapsed, but at least d declined and basically died out or transformed it to something else, because this is also an important perspective to bear in mind. made a couple of videos about those. Uh, but let's say the, f the world formula declined. Uh, what do you see instead in, in fact, even in the passage, in for aforementioned passage um, from the Middle Ages into what we call the Modern Age, um, and both of them definitely never existed as such, really, I mean, much to, much of it, m even the Renaissance as such, really started from the cities. I mean, the city in, in medieval standards is, is, is something... Um, really impressive. It, it's a demic concentration that is completely unknown to the ancient world. Many people say, oh well, but uh, you know, um, medieval cities were kind of worse than the ancient ones because I've read, you know, they, didn't, they even didn't even have sewers until the, the French Revolution or something like that. Um, well, medieval cities are very different from the ancient ones, but not in, in an inferior sense. Uh, the, the Let's say the, the ancient ones were healthier on average, also because they were way less populated than them, uh, than the medieval ones. Of course, there were this huge metropolis, if you take Rome, that is credited to have, have something like one million inhabitants at the peak of its power, etc. But the rest of the cities were something very different from medieval times, were um, into which really the whole broader economical systems revolved around uh, actually the countryside, but it, it it was absorbed by the cities. And when you see the modern age, you realize that, especially in the passage, in fact, the crystallization of society and the, the ancien regime is that the cities uh, in Europe grow increasingly, um, you know, uh, detached. Uh, at least in relative terms, of course, from the countryside, because they start investing uh, abroad in terms of uh, international trade, ships, uh, etc. So that this in part triggered the, um, you know, the the alienation, the the, the emargination, if you want, of the peasantry as well from the uh, political and institutional. Uh, dynamics of, of the newly formed, uh, forming uh, uh, states, we can say at this point. Um, it's a, uh, These are all topics that I discussed here and there, let's say, with more, uh, I mean, with dedicated, with dedicated uh, videos. So if you go into the Medieval Society playlist, you find actually plenty of this stuff. And I've been talking, in fact, uh, <laughs> enough, let's say, to satisfy the, the, the curiosity that, that this and the such topics can spark in you, which I hope exists, but I know that, as, we're, as I was saying before, it's generally, you know, that these are definitely not the hottest topics that Schwerpunkt comes up with, but they're still important because they give you a background, they give you an idea, even how to give a dimension to certain phenomena out there. I generally believe that many people approach Middle Ages just from, like, you know, they, 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 they see a knight, they think it's cool, and it's all about that. And then, then all the rest, this broader dimension uh, that, I mean, the fact even that medieval society had its own evolution and ups and downs and particular transformations, I mean, it, it, in a broader perspective, is completely absent. I mean, it's kind of a flat land where you know, everything always remained the same, Middle Ages were kind of bad, and all this uh, Barrios um, opinions, let's put it in this way, that, that. So, today I would like to discuss actually only a little, very little, um, in general, uh, about one specific topic. Uh, the citizens, and in general how this class developed uh, in terms of um, 
wealth distribution and um, property owning and this stuff and these things are particularly important especially when you want to study actually their, their military history they turn out to be particularly useful because you have always to understand uh, where did this guy really come from? I mean, when you, you look at a communal militia that fights uh, harshly against, uh, let's say, feudal cavalry, you say, well, you know, wh where did this guy come from? Why is that they emerged in certain areas of Europe? Why is that they had this um, power importance? And, and why should we consider them as actually a very important chapter? Definitely, uh, just another uh, consideration that I, uh, that I, uh, actually had stopped to mention but it's what I I, I coniated this um, new uh, new term that is the complex of the giant I mean the idea that when it, you, you take into consideration one kingdom it's always oh look at how it's big on the map and all this school it's cool it must have been so important and then you see the little city and you say oh well this is just a little city I don't give a damn about it well you can't really reason like that because actually certain cities of the Middle Ages had uh, greater uh, income than walled kingdom, kingdoms and their armored forces really didn't have much to, uh, let's say, uh, to envy to them. And I'm serious about this, it's not an exaggeration, of course this happens only in certain specific contexts, not so, I mean, excessively often, but definitely the, at least the financial power of these centers was even what made those same kingdoms working. I mean, if you don't understand how you know uh, medieval banking worked, and uh, knowing that it came straight from from these centers, you you can't understand how you know even a war like I don't know the Hundred Years' War actually functioned because these kingdoms had to take money somewhere, and hell, they couldn't do it uh, <laughs> enough from their own. Uh, feudal system and that few uh, level of centralization that they had started to, to develop exactly for this reason. Um, but um, so coming back on track, what I wanted to, to talk to you about is, um, is first of all shifting the, the attention towards the um, human resources that, uh, especially from a strictly professional point of view, that uh, were present within these communal systems. I mean, within the cities existed definitely certain needs of administra uh, administration, defense, and control of the urban market. Uh, these things were all uh, directly connected because basically the city had the necessity to be fed. I mean, these cities existed only because there was a countryside that produced for them. And they had developed not just from the uh, previous infrastructures existing since Roman times, but also and naturally from and chiefly from trade. I mean, from you know rising as new sometimes even as new centers locally because of all the surplus that they were able to um, treasure through the exaction of tolls, etc. That's why you know, as always, the most important cities emerge on uh, along the major. Uh, ways, whether it's the, their land routes or waterways, um, etc. Um, so there is always the need of administrating this surplus. And it never came um, out of the blue. I mean, these communities were never, um, I mean, completely independent and free or detached from whichever authority had existed previously. As you know, in um, within the, the empire or the, the various kingdoms, uh, every city was part of sort of a public domain. I mean, you you rarely find um, a city that is considered just like. I mean, obviously the city had it was a was considered first of all as a community, right? But obviously it was within the uh, uh, authority of some public figure, right? W within the the feudal hierarchy. So that's what effectively even in the greatest, uh, you know, in the toughest struggle between these cities and the, uh, the feudal authorities, I say better, the public authorities, they, uh, you know, they never quite rejected the existence of this hierarchy. Um, there were certain cities that, you know, in the most um, 
extreme uh, cases, but never without much of a uh, consequence, uh, factual consequences. Um, uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, at least uh, hypothesized or at least defined, um, um, the uh, the total independence from every kind of power. This happened, for example, in late 14th century Florence, and the truth, it's obviously that even though that, for example, was a pretty autonomous city from the empire and it, it, it had its own very old tradition and, um, and, and, and spirit of, uh, you know, it, it's the identitary pride as a free center, or as a republic, as a democracy, let's say, um, very, you know, naturally, very differently meant from what we um, we evidently me at, uh, mean today with the same terms really was still you know, within the system right so um, and, and even after that you know n never quite I mean nothing really follow at, followed at the end of the day there were cities that had other traditions though like for example Venice that for example, it had originated from the Byzantine Empire, so it had, had remained a sort of a eastern enclave in the West. That, in, in practice, it, it, it simply meant that they, they were even outside the Holy Roman Empire, so they were they, they were de facto independent in, in many ways. But still, even the, uh, I mean, the, the same nature of Europe in its political fragmentation brought definitely these centers. It doesn't matter how autonomous or sometimes even independent formally they could be under uh, under the necessity of being, um, let's say, at least under the influence of some other power, uh, because there is no one there that was completely isolated and nobody really did anything about it. So all these traditions. Um, naturally had stemmed mostly from um, economical and uh, military um, necessities. And this is pretty obvious, right? You start collecting all this surplus, you need to defend it because you're gon gonna uh, attract uh, vultures are around your pile of, 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 of treasures. So the, the, the problem at this point is to organize a community that um can um in, in, in th that cannot work really on the same basis that it had always worked at least from from the feudal standards i mean the city is and that's what i was saying before is in europe largely i mean the, the city state something like a sort of an exception. I mean, I don't mean it completely because obviously it was plenty of city states m everywhere. Think about the the Ansa. Think about the 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 Italian cities, um, uh, but but many others. I mean, basically every single kingdom in Europe had its own cities, and they were recognized as such. There were even certain proper titles that were entrusted, think about the German free cities of the empire, the Freie Reichsstädte, that had definitely their, they earned their, their status, albeit in a condition of, you know, solid subordination uh, to mo to the surrounding, um, or at least of, you know, in incapability of competition with the surrounding uh, princely powers. Um, and uh, this e exists in Spain, it, it exists in France, it exists pretty much everywhere. And actually cities are, are very important and they don't have to be um, simply taken um, in a kind of an oppositional sense towards the feudal hierarchy. They were part of the feudal hierarchy, they were just I mean, they were part of the, the, the various lo local communities with their uh, customs and their their rights, their traditions that were represented somewhere. And naturally, certain uh, cer certain regions of Europe, you know, had a, a greater um, importance. I, I mean, the, the cities in Europe had a greater importance. I mean, think about I don't know the, the, the Eastern Europe. It's not that cities were particularly developed in there in general. Uh, or think about instead Italy where basically the local states are formed on the base of single cities. That is something incredible because this could have never happened in, uh, uh, in places like England or France that were this great monarchies b by tradition that were meant to rule over the, the, all the other communities not to be you know, even overthrown. 
uh, like it had happened with with uh, German kings in, fr from Italy. So the the problem in there is something you know like how to frame these communities in the local in, in the local system and and actually they leave a lot of game into this the, the many cities were used in fact to support uh, central power especially in the presence of very aggressive aristocracies this is the case of the free germans uh, the free cities of the empire in germany i was telling it to you before basically it's not that the single cities were particularly strong um, but they could be recognized basically as as any uh, you know as free cities by the emperor, so that nobody could mess up with them, and this means that local prince that wanted to expand fr from a solely rural few and feudal base over these cities couldn't, because the city was granted this uh, this rights by the emperor and was meant to grow and to expand. Th that is though a case in which the, the, the you know these free cities never quite for example, extended their power behind, uh, beyond the, 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 their city walls. I mean, they were the city point, but outside it was uh, another world. Um, something similar happened, for example, even in the process of, of construction of the French monarchy, uh, in, especially in the 13th century, where definitely cities are pretty much on the rise. You have, for example, um, the local even bishops there the, in the Ile de France that are particularly um, um, important, they also contributed themselves to the rise of the monarchy, but at a certain point it become too strong, so, so since the area is pretty fertile and there are certain towns that are growing, the French king backs them, uh, depending on the local political game, every once in a while to, you know, to, to stem maybe that particular competitor, etc., and then maybe letting them simply being slaughtered where when they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't um, serve to him anymore for, for that specific task. So you see that even in the French case, where uh, that was definitely imbued with this uh, radically uh, aristocratic mindset, where obviously the commoners were just, you know, garbage, nothing else. Um, still, you can find the cooperation of the sovereign uh, with with the city, and the cities definitely had to participate with their contingents to the royal army and so on, etc. But the city also had to organize militarily by by themselves, and, and that's what they already did. So, in this case, they didn't quite invent much. Also, because at the moment of, uh, I mean, the, uh, on on. I mean, of new on purpose because the the moment in which they were framed into the royal royal institutions, they had already been forming these uh, uh, autonomous um, governments by themselves, and uh, and it was normal in, in really, especially from a feudal perspective, that the um, local communities were autonomously organized. They they, they were, uh, organized by themselves. The 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 role of the the responsibility of, of the sovereign was simply to protect these centers um, with a sword, essentially, and to render justice. I mean, the, the king was essentially this: the warrior and the judge, and and that was what he was. And obviously, uh, when there were bigger issues that couldn't make these communities solving matters by themselves so even the juridical level was definitely an extremely important one to play on these on the especially and to try to the, the construction of a certain autonomy or maybe a certain interference from the side of kings etc so imagine that this is by standard a world in which the king basically cannot um, have anything to say in terms of local customs. Basically, if the, if the, the city, uh, I mean, has in this case, but it could be any other community, had his own laws, the king could not change it. Because it's all, his only duty was to protect that law. That law. It wasn't even the community power. I mean, obviously, if the community was aggressed, physically had to, 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 to defend it, but, I mean, it, it was really mostly about the law. I mean, about the this mm, uh, political and juridical dialectic that passed through the local customs that had to be uh, legitimized and, and, and I mean they had to be safeguarded and and therefore also the story of the construction of the modern state is the the progressive um, 
shift of these prerogatives into the hand of the king, but however was largely consensual, at least initially, uh, in the sense that it was a sort of contract, just like the feudalism had been born in, in this fashion for which, uh, you know, it, it was mostly the local communities that, that entrusted part of their rights to the local lord to be defended. Well, so it went on when larger kingdoms uh, were rising. Naturally, there were regions in Europe where this was m more accentuated. For example, in France. In France, at the end of the Middle Ages, there was this greater consensus uh, on the fact that, more or less, yeah, the king had this as anywhere else in feudal Europe, just to safeguard the local customs. But at the end of the day, if, if he made a new law, uh, the, the, the communities were kind of okay with that. This was very different, for example, in England, that, as you know, after especially the Magna Carta was uh, completely different. You know, it was really the parliament who had, in fact, to 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 check the, that the, the king would not interfere on other affairs rather than what's that the same communities asked to. So, and naturally, the, the, the situation, <laughs> excuse me, was much more shaded than this, but I'm trying to, to approximate just to make you understand the differences. Um, but th there was this sort of homogeneity in part. Um, for what it takes, also the control of the urban uh, of of the market. Of, of course, the city is is revolving chiefly around the market. I mean, probably cities are born first of all because of market activities. Um, the the city is this great uh, great center um, of logistical distribution of supplies. Um, it's usually walled, so it's well defended, it's it, it's imposant, I mean, even strategically speaking. So the idea is that um, the local community has to have a control on income, etc. So um, different cities had different masters in this sense. Originally, really vo th those who ruled in the city since um, modern, uh, I mean, uh, since um, late Roman times, were the bishops. I mean, the bishops, according to the Roman and 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 uh, ecclesiastical um, administration, were city. Uh, I mean, urbanly settled, and, and this is the the rule basically everywhere, except in places like Ireland, for example, where you know the the bishops are living in monasteries out of. Not even out of the city, because probably in Ireland there are no <laughs> cities, actually. Um, so you can see even from England how this differs. Uh, but obviously in post-Roman Europe, the 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 pivot, the, ca the cornerstone of local domination is is the city, keeps being the city in a certain sense, especially and obviously in the most urbanized areas in Europe. Um, in Northern Europe, it's mostly still about the rural. Uh, world, there is a change, there is a shift into this. I made some videos about this a transformation in the Western Roman Empire in the late, uh, like between the third and fifth century. I think one of the titles is is that one. Um, so that I don't know. In fact, in in, in northern France, uh, yeah, cities. But let's say the city, to to make it not to make it too complicated, um, reemerges broadly since the. Only from from the fifth century as this new uh, center of trade, and this goes along actually with the same development of th of the countryside. It's actually the city actually is born out of uh, in its mm, power from the high Middle Ages, um, in terms of its power from the countryside properly. I mean, it's really the resources that are shifted from the countryside that pass through the city that make the city. The, the great center that it is. Excuse me, I drink a little. So, um, the the bishop maintains the control of, of, of the market most of the times, right? Uh, you can see this, for example, in Germany, where, where bishops are very, uh, very, very powerful. They basically, even create certain true I mean the, the feudal I mean the, they're feudal lords at the same time as urban lords so they even create their own um, electorates uh, in the, their electoral lands in um, 
in, in that fashion. I mean, as great um, uh, landowners, right? Even and exer exercising power in the city, there are struggles in there. For example, between the people in the city, but in Germany, it's the, uh, the the people and the bishop. But in Germany, it's the bishop that wins by norm. Uh, in a country like Italy, it was the other way around. Basically, um, the uh, the bishop is never quite overthrown. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't overthrow a bishop proper because you know, every city uh, has a diocese and and also there's not no conveniency in, in not having that diocese. That, by the way, is something what that makes you earn a freaking lot I mean, ter as a city proper. But so what the Italians do basically is that they start acting in terms of all these classes that had developed very often around the same um, episcopal milieu uh, in terms of middle classes etc to act on behalf of the bishop like saying uh, for example the term comitatus is, is something that was addressed in uh, in post religion uh, in Carolingian and post religion times as the local district right they, they were actually uh, the same uh, dioceses from from Roman times. You know that in Roman times the diocese was not just uh, actually the the ecclesiastical districtuation of the empire, but actually properly the 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 imperial one. I mean the diocese had come to 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 mean this uh, locally based. So uh, that's more the uh, the 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 cast in which they they act, and 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 this. And, and in Italy, especially since Ottonian times, the bishops were basically entrusted the communal power in there because after in, Carolin in Carolingian times, basically the the counts ruled the, the, this district, the, the diocese that had therefore a temporal ruler was the the, um, the count and the spiritual ruler that was the, the bishop. So, for reasons that now we can't explain, but I made some videos about Ottonian Italy and, you know, generally speaking, with the Ottonian pol the, the the policies that the Ottonians applied in Italy for the sake of control, you know, completely decentralized um, situation, etc., is that basically the bishops had taken the place of the counts, right? So, basically, the bishop had uh, assumed the same. It's not. It was literally a count, but it had the same communal rights under his control. So what happens in there is that, at a certain point, the the the, the this middle classes emerge. They are able to, uh, if not to overthrow the bishop, but at least to, to force him to, to participate to their activity, to the commune. In fact, that is being born as a political um, community within the city walls, and to expand the urban control the, the urban dominion over the surrounding countryside this is a characteristic in uh, that's typical of Italy and you don't find many other many other places actually of, of cities that were able to expand their power beyond their city walls proper um, militarily I mean that is to say that they started even to subjugate the, the local lords in the in the countryside they even held they even started conquering each other as cities, as communes. So that's what makes it um, uh, so interesting. And you can understand how beyond, behind this um, there is a definitely a very articulated and complex social reality because you, you do not get to have I mean a political military direction if you don't have something that resembles in fact a uh, you know a, a power on, on its own well this starts and that's why we dedicated so many in case you wondered so many videos about communal Italy proper when talking about the European communes broadly meant because Italy is the place where this goes beyond I mean these cities are able to break free from the feudal hierarchy and to start to to basically do the same thing on their own which includes subjugating other cities. There's absolutely not, uh, you know, idea that the, the feudal hierarchy was oppressive as such, and the other communities weren't. That these were kind of pure uh, uh, freedom fighters that just wanted no. They just wanted to to rule over each other, and this is the standard uh, in medieval times, as actually many others, as always. So. Uh, but it's what behind this that is particularly interesting, and it's no surprise that in fact these um, Italian centers were 
the wealthiest, the most literate, the uh, let's say the, the most, um, for example, juridically advanced in Europe, um, and and uh, to great interest even of uh, the for the uh, public or from the imperial authority. I mean, for example, when uh, the the Hohenstaufen. Uh, start to reclaim uh, the imperial rights in the Italic kingdom um, and obviously they that escalates uh, into warfare into open warfare still there were naturally Italian society with with with, with the German Emperor and, um, and and the German Emperor was extremely interested in what for example the Bolognese school of, of law was was achieving that because basically uh, those guys were uh, now recovering the ancient Roman law, um, which um, had been basically forgotten up to that time in in, in Western Europe, that was particularly interesting for the emperor, uh, for one simple reason that um, that was the Theodosian Codex, the Justinian Code, uh, re I mean that had reward the Theodosian one that, w that stated what wh what it was like actually in the Byzantine Empire. That is that the church doesn't have i mean it's the emperor rules over the church and the church cannot say what the emperor has to do which in the 12th century in the 13th century well that's quite of a thing to 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 show for example to the popes that are controlling the imperial election they're uh, they're basically uh, c contesting the the, the 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 ultimate universal power to with to, to the emperors so this started from this urban world the universities universities are born in these contexts in this urban contexts um and chiefly for juridical studies um eventually then they, they evolved uh italy was all about law basically uh france was all about theology and uh, obviously it were mixed levels i mean imminent uh, school of law were, were also in montpellier uh, but interestingly enough, that's southern France, that's Occitane, um, and Occitane has uh, striking similarities to uh, central and northern Italy, for example, and and partly because it's urbanized in the same way. So you realize that these urban communities have uh, very close uh, mindsets sometimes. They have, obviously, yeah, southern France is also very different from, from, from Italy, but it, they, 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 there is something that is shared. If anything, in the language, I mean, think that these were kind of very similar countries in the, uh, at the time, especially before you know, uh, southern. F I mean, Occitan proper was kind of um, Frenchized. Uh, I don't know even how to say, it. <laughs> you know, after the, uh, especially after the, the, the third, if starting from the thirteenth century, but. Um, it's evident that uh, th th there is civilization there. I mean, I think the greatest accomplishments of European uh, civilization during the Middle Ages stem from this th the feudal monarchies, especially in the case of um, England, France, and um, and Spain, uh, especially the Castile, uh, but also other centers. Um, in terms of you know, institutional development in part and progressive centralization, uh, given especially the extension of their empires and territories. Uh, Germany has definitely its, its importance, especially in creating this kind of federal um, uh, institution that is naturally typical of the local Germanic tradition, but at the same time, it is, is also a failure of the German monarchy in the sense that the Germans tried with the orange stuff and to create something more centralized like France and England that they failed in Germany because they partly also because they were so obsessed with uh, you know creating a, and rightfully obsessed I would say a Mediterranean Empire centered on Italy and to rule from there um, and and Italy definitely has the other great uh, place uh, because they created humanism they created the Renaissance it all st and it all stemmed from the city it all stemmed from the city and that's why urban I mean uh, communal civilization is so important because um, even but even if you take Germany for example Germany especially in the late Middle Ages um, is um, I mean paradoxically federalism and the explosion of the monarchy so in this ter terribly 
politically fragmented picture uh, with hundreds of little states, but at the same time, uh, kind of um, sparks the, the autonomy of these centers. Um, German cities in the late Middle Ages were heavily advanced places. I mean, Germany and Italy, for example, towards the late Middle Ages were the, the most advanced countries in, in Europe, technologically speaking, for example. Think about, um, you know, the effort. I mean, it can even sound a little funny, but think about clock engines. I mean, th those were things that were mastered in places like Germany. Um, but industries were was were being I mean industries in the sense that we I mean in the non truly industrial sense but something pro industrial were were starting in in some of the most communal regions in Europe take Flanders the Lowlands uh, the Netherlands um, and Italy as well um, so and where cities were more developed or 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 the German Hansa for example. Uh, all these cities that you know flourished in the, in the in the North Sea and in the Baltic Sea because they they were in fact city states. City Europe. If you go into northern Germany, you visit these tremendously beautiful cities like uh, Bremen or Hamburg or Lübeck, um, Stralsund, etc. You you still can breathe the the idea. I mean, they, they tell you basically that you know we are the like. Uh, the, the, some of the most ancient existing independent states, because they don't even reason the fact that they are because in, they are uh, in a federation proper. That's how they see it. The, even the fact that they are in, into Germany, that they simply joined them freely <laughs> in in the sense. Uh, even if history obviously was a bit of different, it's not that they could do by the way very much at the time of the unification on their own, but. They, they they feel it because they realize that they and and that's a very very interesting um, piece of medieval um, freedom um, surviving in still in a, in a modern con and that's quite fascinating that's quite fascinating and that tells you how far um, and how uh, you know it, yeah just reflect on it because it really deserves it and uh, what it means f uh, on the value of freedom proper that can even get radically uh, you know extremist from from one side I mean there is a difference for example between liberty and freedom um, it's kind of negative freedom positive freedom to consider um, but it stems from there and it stems it makes you understand brilliantly what actually the ancien regime was based on that is not the idea the simple idea that that the classist interpretations have made of this that is basically you know the, 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 there was just a bunch of pri privileged classes that wanted to rule over the board but well yeah they, they basically happened like that that's why there were big things like you know the, the French Revolution for instance um, that sparked after centuries of oppression but it, it's still not about it it's still the idea that everybody has kind of earned its own place on the base of its own um, diversity and independence and in an individual right. I mean, the idea that, d that we should all take a um, decision together and not impose on others uh, what what others do not really want. And that th this this thing has its own limits. I mean, it's fascinating. I personally, the, I, I've, th there's been a moment in my life, especially when I was younger, which I was totally in love this, with this libertarian ideal. Then, you know, deepening a little bit more into history, I realized that actually civilization, I mean, whichever interpretation you want to give to this, but civilization does pass through oppression and it's unavoidable. Hierarchies are needed to to develop civilization then you can adjust them but think these things happen but therefore also uh, this is why for example historically speaking this free um, uh, pers let's say this in the independentistic perspectives have at the end of the day failed I mean nor the Hanseatic League nor the Italian city-states nor um, other uh, centers of this kind were able to man to preserve their freedom or to maintain a true, um, let's say, a, a sort of a complete autonomy. They were swallowed, or at least they were they were eventually um, uh, controlled by someone else.
Right, and and that's when you look at the construction of the modern state that eventually culminated into the creation of the nation state at the end of the modern age. But you know, take a state like France that the time of Louis the Fourteenth becomes basically the hegemonic power in Europe. Or um, I mean, civilization passed through those powers, and that definitely you can make a kind of a moral. Um, critique to this, uh, you can look, for example, I don't know, the French Revolution, Napoleonic Empire, you know, if you, you ask the, the average British person, for example, you know, you know, Napoleon is still a monster, and it, it, it's logically so, if you really understand, and I personally, you know, I can't say I fully agree, but I definitely understand it, and I don't have um, any particular appreciation in the sense towards Napoleon, uh, Napoleon the, 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 the man, or um, but um, there is still some, I mean, some civilization that passed through uh, Napoleonic conquests, etc., uh, including, you know, I even in a negative sense. I mean, we, we wouldn't be talking about von Clausewitz if there hadn't been Napoleonic wars. So let's say that even this contrasts and this violence and this uh, oppressions spark civilization to cope with them, at least, if anything. And sometimes, however, it can go wrong in the sense that there are entire communities that were literally wiped out uh, historically in many contexts that 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 are, do not exist today anymore to to tell their their own story, and this is also pretty sad. But history is really about this, and it's uh, uh, we we should you know reflect on the value of uh, of freedom, but also on its limits and what you can accomplish with other approaches like with liberty for example but aside from this um, the so speaking speaking once again of, of the bishops uh, since we were discussing it before when you look at um, you know bishops as we've seen especially in certain areas of Europe were becoming very very powerful within the cities they had their own they were the lords of the cities Let's be honest about it, especially after, I mean, during the time of the second invasions, uh, certain kingdoms couldn't s control anymore the locals, the cities of the, their own uh, their own domains, and these cities st simply started uh, dealing with problems on their own. I mean, the, 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 there is all huge chapters that we, ha we will have to discuss, and partly already discussed, actually, on especially the... Mm, the, the institutional developments uh, during the, the crumbling of the Carolingian Empire, where bishops were basically asking the king to, say, build castles, for example, because there were, say, the Vikings were raiding around. And, and obviously, they don't wait for the king's green light. They simply start building those fortifications on their own, because, hell, they need that. And the bishop is, by tradition, the great organizer of this. I mean, especially in France, in that context, uh, when it was hit hard by the Vikings, you see that, you know, in French um, bishops were actually pretty pretty powerful since uh, Roman times. It was this Gallo-Roman tradition for which the bishop had emerged, not just as the head of the local church, but also as a, actually as a lord both politically and militarily. How, what do you expect to be a bishop of the 10th century? He was obviously a, a nobleman. Point. It's not that there was much difference from from a, uh, a lay lord. Um, but, in, especially in those um, areas of Europe where also in the infrastructural basis helped and um, provided the, the local um, governments with, you know, with substantial basis, naturally, there were many, let's say, especially professional groups um, that, wor had, that worked together, I mean, for, actually for the bishop. I mean, the jurisdictional or administrative activity of the bishops was obviously and concretely sustained by this group of, um, of professional judges, and uh, notaries, so these were people that naturally maintained uh, within the, you know, th along the centuries, their, their great importance. These were people that evidently knew how to read and write, 
Um, so this produced, and, and this obviously emerges from realities in which uh, people s uh, needed this uh, written culture because the the economical activity necessitated this. I mean, th these groups do not rise in places uh, uh, at the outskirts of Europe where, you know, nobody had ever seen a, s a city or ev everything was completely rural because in there they, they would have never needed something like that. These were groups that were required in places where such huge amounts of wealth and power were uh, requiring a better management of, of, of the same. So this will go on in the, in especially notaries in certain regions of Europe uh, for example in Tuscany at a certain point like towards the 13th to 14th century like I don't want to say but like uh, I can't say uh, a, a very strong demographic amount of people were notaries and, and that tells you the, the degree of notaries but were basically uh, re required to, to, to in fact to notify to certify certain documents. And these documents were mostly economical transitions, uh, as you can imagine. So, obviously, these figures were emerging in areas where the power was, and was, uh, I mean, the, 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 we uh, the, the, the local economy and trade, etc., required this. Initially, this had started from the cities, from, from uh, I mean, and still remained in the city, of course, but it started in, in say, in the High Middle Ages, from the, the bishop's milieu. Hmm? Then, naturally, another very, p uh, as for, for th those same trade activities that we're talking, naturally the cities were inhabited by merchants and artisans. The merchants were those who, you know, helped shifting all this wealth. Obviously, the merchant is kind of a... Um, here, uh, the role of the merchant is very... It's much more controversial than it's usually thought, in the sense that you know, if you read Pierre's thesis, basically, he he wrote. I mean, it's I know I, it's like shooting on the Red Cross when you talk about Pierre. We all know, but that's a kind of a good example. Um, the um, that the fact is that basically Europe re uh, resuscitated thanks to the interpreter new reality of the merchants, right? As if you know, Europe rose once again because there was a guy who decided to to take these goods. Uh, here and there for for no apparent reason but just for you know because he hoped he could get but it, it was obviously a, a system that was largely developed on its own and and actually the great unsung heroes of the European economical revivals are the um, is the feudal elite actually and this is something you definitely will never hear in a Marxist uh, class because obviously the pile of garbage that they need to tell is basically that feudal uh, lords were the great oppressors of the poor people. It's absolutely not like that. The great birth, rebirth of Europe in the High Middle Ages, the development of the cities, starts chiefly by the interpreniality of the feudal lords, because those were the guys who invested um, in the, in production, who compartmentalized the resources, the incomes, and 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 put and had the means to put them into circulation at at long range, and that's where merchants are you know required. So it's not really the merchant who triggered it. It's it's the feudal lord living in a world that was all but uh, economically closed, but it was you know uh, continentally open actually. Uh, really makes this great um, revival, and and naturally it, the artisans are also those who you know start living in the city. They have enough to eat. Evidently, always remember that, that the medieval cities were um, starting to be so large not because the you know f f uh, birth rate increased or or uh, child you know mortality reduced. It's it's simply that. Uh, people migrated from the country into the city, right? And many of these people went there because evidently it was work for them, and many of them specialized, in fact, in this, because there is already a surplus. So a surplus that is used to pay these guys without them breaking their backs in, in, in the countryside for making grain, etc. Um, so these people can specialize in other activities, 
that are not of uh, you know food production and, and they're the one of the artisans the craftsmen that um, are directly involved into those trade activities that that uh, will make Europe arising so much at this point and then you know that the artisan starts from from this you know throughout the century the, the we can ideally think of the early artisan making you know pottery stuff like that then expanding investing in other activities getting a greater business and then associating with other merchants and forming these corporations of guilds and then you know reaching the top of the uh, of, of society and even pushing out knights from the city and creating their own kind of uh, oligarchy in the city and so so this very fast rising that will make this um, bourgeoisie basically reaching the same level of wealth of monarchs in Europe and that's the reason why you find uh, you know people who were rise the head rising from these city states that will become royalty after all in, in medieval times as well as modern times because they were the ones who literally financed the whole Europe uh, and with, with the money that they had made. Uh, think about the Medici. Uh, we will talk about them in a few days, for example, but th th there is a countless list of, of the case. And the problem here, everybody was always, as always, hungry for money. Uh, every power was constantly in war. These, these power, the city-states, were basically the only ones who made always enough money to have a reserve of those. Um, and uh, and therefore to to make war, but still be keeping being rich. Instead, other monarch uh, monarchies basically uh, were chronically in indebted, and they were always struggling to make. Um, and this is very meaningful because it's even a bit like today. You know, um, uh, it, it's you know I would I would argue it's very easy to control a small state, uh, finan especially investing in financial activities amidst much bigger systems that evidently uh, you know are very difficult to be governed um, and because they're big systems and they kind of a uh, and, and, and these little states can exploit the um, say the, the the niche that derives in terms of money expenses etc from the other countries and specializing in, in financial activities I mean it's a it's a very very difficult task to to control a country like the UK or Germany or France or Italy, it's very, very, um, very easy to control in the sense a state like Luxembourg or Switzerland or, and 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 that they're clever countries. I'm not criticizing them, of course, but you know there is a reason for w which this happens. So actually, and, and this partly re um, you know refers to the criticism that I was doing before to, to freedom. I mean, it's not that if we really were all free, like without uh, big states, we would all be richer. Uh, this is the myth of, of the little guy that is able to 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 live out of the, uh, let's say, of the leftovers of the big ones and making a freaking lot of money from his own perspective in this sense and um, and, and, and having an easy life. Uh, but big powers have this chronic uh, economical problems and they, they, they are the ones that effectively lead most of the others at the end of the day. Um, but it's also important in fact to be acquainted with this political perspectives when you when you study the um, even the, fin uh, the development of finance in, in these contexts like you know it's obviously f why were Italian cities so wealthy because they, were, they were in a freaking good geographical position they uh, it was not about the fact that the local country was wealthy or in by itself because of fertility because of certain resources actually you know but it's because basically they were the trans, uh, transactioners they were the ones who literally shifted the wealth from from east to west and they could you know take a part of it in the process and 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 if you know this would have been more complicated, for example, if Europe had been, you know, uh, far, far more, um, um, you know, fragmented than it, uh, what it actually was. I mean, for example, Florence made a freaking lot of money with the Kingdom of England, 
uh, if anything, at one point the English are not able to pay them anymore because the, the, the crown goes bankrupt during the Hundred Years' War. So this causes domino effect, all the Tuscan banks collapse, uh, the, the, it's a mess. But these things start happening, and this is important to understand when you look at Europe at the time, so that you can't look at only one place and say, okay, well, that's all I need to know because I like it, let's say it's my own. No, you have to be able to look at the whole thing because that's really how that was. And you don't render a good service to the memory of of your ancestors or people you're interested in for whichever reason if you don't consider that they weren't what you wish for some reason to have been. That is to say, kind of the highlanders of the situation were so free and proud and cool because they were, you know, turns out most of the those contexts were kind of primitive people at the outskirts of civilization. So uh, that can be a value if you want, but you know, you know, probably they didn't have much a happier life than what these other guys were were doing. But aside from this, um, so what is important though? I think it's another key uh, factor to to understand when looking at development of these city systems is that um, the cities do not just expand because they 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 live at the outskirts of the feudal world and they are able to fuel this but actually the feudal world is present within the city I mean the great land estate owners live within the city with a rent, usually, you know, uh, what you see, especially in this big uh, medieval cities, is that the guy from the uh, the countryside, that presumably descended from, say, Carolingian nobility, or I mean, not strictly Carolingian, but let's say the the, the Basilitic beneficiary, uh, blah, whatever I'm saying, well, communal uh, lineages, let's say, that maybe had intermarried with other local unknown people, is it? But they had castles, they had private retinues, and they were chiefly rural powers, right? At a certain point, towards the 11th century, uh, actually they had always had kind of a uh, economical vitality, thanks to the supplies they could store in the castles and to put in motion, what we were saying before. But at a certain point, especially if they lived close to a city, the city starts becoming... Um, violently competitive and this means that their grain their stuff is for example now much cheaper and it doesn't make so money so uh, what happens on the long run is that many of these um, rural knights and vassalatic uh, families basically uh, get urbanized and go live into the city Obviously, maintaining their castles and properties, etc., but also, you know, living in the city and investing in the city. Uh, not just they they build their houses in their house towers. Basically, they are castles in, within the city, and they start controlling the city because this is also how it began, really. I mean, even in the in those areas of Europe in which the local, I mean, the com the commoners were more powerful. Actually, the the very first part of, of their history is still um, about the feudal knights ruling within the city. And then this grows progressively oppositional, but actually the city also exists thanks to those. Um, the, uh, the knights, in the sense, get into this uh, Episcopal centers, sometimes they are allied with the bishops, sometimes with the people, and they all cooperate maybe when they have to fight with the neighboring city, and they have this broader shared interests. Let's say that the knight brought the grain from the from the uh, countryside, and the local merchant made money and, and could export it from the city. Then maybe I don't know, was a coastal center, was connected with the east with Constantinople, with the Arabs, um, and um, let's say that and then maybe the, the knight made more money, it could invest in a better agricultural production and specialize the cultures and make further money that are partly reinvested in the city or that have a spin-off for the city development in any way. 
and this goes on literally like this and this is how communal communal civilization really develops it's not just you know the bunch of commoners and artisans to go there work some stuff and become rich and that's it uh, that's a reductive simplistic and and that's why also I, I suspect many people don't like this phase of history or just topic in history anymore because they think it was all about the you know the shoemaker right or the weird you know the guy who sells bread and it's not really about that it's really about and uh, you know uh, the same feudal world and s social segmentation obviously with different ratios but still the same thing with knights and uh and and and, and armies and bloodshed and and political stuff and uh, and, and art and, and law and, and and literature and economy i mean it, it basically all you can find in the medieval world stays in the city and it starts partly from from that as well so this is particularly important and the connection between the city and the countryside is the key element the city leaves off of the countryside that's the only thing and, and that's why certain cities manage to expand on it and to build their power through the, a territorial control which naturally brings even to the contrast with the knights why do you think for example the knights at a certain point for example get um, you know um, emarginated or at least discriminated juridically economically in the city because sometimes they become too powerful and the, the people how are is powerful as well it wants to reduce their power or maybe it's expanding the countryside and it wants to expand with its militias in a place where there is the castle of a noble and a noble obviously doesn't want so that's how it is so even the city in this sense is, is not one monolithic block with just a government with a guy that represents the whole city and the whole city does that you know it's always several factions within the same uh, community that are segmented on the base not not of class you know r usually th these factions are always at the uh, you know they're handed by some knightly family and then there are the respective people that maybe live even within the same city in different quarters that making may that maybe make war with each other they trebuchet uh, at each other they, they throw crossbow bolts so it's, it's really cool really in the way it develops and it des deserves really a, m a lot more of attention because it's it's really cool and I hope I will get much more in detail one day on Schwerpunkt this is just at a broader interactive level but if you start studying the city of, of uh, excuse me the, the, this, the history of, of all of the single cities you'll find that it's really amazing and it's worth the pain to study this stuff um then what else can we say um another thing that happens in the city let's say is the distinction between the various classes that as we've just said it's very blurry right because especially if you take this great italian communes or uh, a bit all over uh, the peninsula in that case you never find a rigid distinction between the class of merchants and of the artisans and the one of, of, of land owners for example this is particularly important to understand even how wealth was distributed for example in a kingdom like the one of France uh, it was normally you know the literally the wealthiest aristocracy in Europe owning the major the wide majority of all properties and and the rest of, of the people that in France were also many actually because the big giants of of, of populations at this time in medieval Europe are Italy and France um, and they they live poorly in, in in communal Italy for example in in the Italy of the cities you find instead that uh, the the middle class um, is substantially well off uh, I, I always like to remember that Italy at this time is the uh, country with the highest wealth per capita in the world and and, and and therefore this means that there aren't actually a massive feudal dynasties like you can find in other countries uh, especially the feudalized the most feudalized ones but you actually have that the average person is kind of better off they kind of they, they live in a decent way even, even the countryside for example uh, Italy is a place where you uh, basically the countryside is never detached from the city 
Like in, in, in countries like France or Germany, for example, you have these huge areas sometimes uh, where there is the world of the forest, like the entire communities that live isolated, for example, from the urban world. I mean, they know it's there, but they have nothing to do with it because they're not economically connected with it. And that produces very different perspectives, also different settlements. I mean, even in today's Europe, actually, you can see the... Uh, the differences um, of settlements, like it's not just geographically speaking, but also in this former political and social distribution. I mean, if you go to Austria, you, it's uh, I did not make examples, but let's say that there are way different way different ways of living. I mean, north of the Alps, generally speaking, there is uh, there are less big centers and more scattered centers. Uh, this that, for example, uh, a pretty interesting distinction. Um, this has naturally also a lot to do with the former Roman domination. Like, for example, France is a bit of a hybrid in this sense because northern France is much more like Germany in some ways. Well, it's still very different, but it has that uh, idea that th there are scattered rural rural centers that are more kind of a um, like a, a tissue, right? And you, in southern France, you have still, you know, the, the city, the, the the individual city with the, um, the that specific urban tissue instead that connects it all. So naturally, every region is different, and I don't want to make comparisons. But you know, um, land distribution is important. In the case of Italy, for example, is most interesting. In communal Europe, you find that. Um, you know, assume you have a city, the, the map of the city, and then you have the, it inscribed in the, in the broader district. So what happens is that the city is divided into several uh, quarters, or, I mean, sometimes they were divided in four, in six, in three, I mean, it, it depends on the city. Then you find that if you extend this section outside of the city wall from its side, all the people that live in that part of the city naturally have their properties scattered in front of the city wall, right? So you understand, for example, that from this you you, you understand factionalism because even deciding uh, at a communal level from which direction the commune should expand, for example, is a big deal for the people who live within the city because, you know, Expanding east instead of west might mean that, you know, those guys from that side will expand, will have more, you know, to to gain from the others or another side from the guys from another side. It's it's not just based on this simple geographical orientation, but it's actually it it's dramatically more complicated than this. But it still has a lot to do with with these things as well. Um, so one thing that, for example, happens in Italy for this different wealth distribution is that you don't have really a um, nobility on the base of blood, but you have it on a sensual base. This is, for example, the prerogative. We will, I will, we will make basically videos on uh, tracing the differences of all the various European um, knighthood and nobility. The characteristic of Italy, for example, is that the local nobility is not just urban, but it's also sensual, which means that basically the, the, the nobility is created by the communes um, on the basis of how wealthy the people are. And in one of the first um, criteria on which this is based is actually the military participation. That is to say, like in, in full feudal Europe, in like, um, the guy who has enough money for having a war horse and um, a coat of mail and a sword must serve the commune like that, with that equipment, or, or at least to pay someone the equivalent or to pay someone else for on to go to war on behalf of the person. And this person automatically becomes the miles, it uh, automatically becomes the knight. Um, and uh, you have the knightly class, it's completely identical to all the other uh, ones of Europe, for example. We were talking that there were other differences elsewhere, for example, in Germany, this much more rural 
um, but also for other reasons actually uh, um, we made some uh, a video some time ago on uh, on the origins of the German ministeriales for example that 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 stems a bit uh, back uh, in, in time but this is also important because um, the really the, the process of this in this case of, of nobility of the knightly class of the military class really has its roots within the the tenth century right actually in the case of cities you can see that European cities is at least the ones that maintain more continuity with Roman times where they are more dynamic etc um, they um, they, they ne never quite lacked this form of aristocracy. You kn we know that actually in, in, even d during early medieval times you have certain um, uh, certain classes within the cities that are armed, for example, they have their clientels, they work, they, I mean, they, they, they control partly the city, they, they, they fight, they, they quarrel against each other, so it's the usual, um, it's the usual thing you find in, in albeit in different relation even in the um, rest of the Middle Ages um, but let's say that as we have seen now the case of, of, of high medieval urban development is, is is very meaningful because the city is a great um, social I mean it's difficult to express in this way but let's say that it creates new forms of elite an elite that is non-feudal that's the interesting thing. In fact, when when the Hohenstaufen invite uh, invade uh, Italy, and they they look at these cities because they have been called, by the way, because they were these were subjects to the empire, and there were certain Italian cities that were saying, "Look, this guy, the bigger guy, is wants to conquer me. Please, emperor, come here and save me because I don't want." And 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 this was something that was, I mean, we probably fail to understand because we're not used to, to this kind of perspectives but I it's you know the, the cultural shock to see for a Swabian uh, dynasty ducal and eventually royal and imperial dynasty of, of the 12th century to look at the world where you know the city the urban elite of commoners that were not noblemen that had nothing to do with the feudal elite could rule over noblemen in the countryside. This was something incredible. I mean, the fact that a city like Milan, for example, could, um, you know, impose its rule on noblemen. I mean, people of noble birth, because they had an army that was stronger than theirs, and they could even cope with the freaking imperial army eventually. Well, that was something really, really abnormal. And that's why also we, you know, it's kind of very easy to talk about Italy when mentioning the communes because it, it's obviously the region in Europe where this thing went you know uh, most far right uh, but it's also in fact something big and structural I mean there were not really exceptions like one city here and one city there it, it was a, a world system that really worked on that base in an entire region that incidentally is also one of the most intensely populated in Europe like one-fourth of the Europeans at this point live in Italy and they um, so and, and this is basically the 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 dual trade balance of the continent because all this system basically became that rich thanks chiefly to this merchants and trade and this activity uh, so just to tell you how important communal Europe really is um, and how nobody really gives a damn. We think to we prefer to stick to the fact of the castle, the tournament, and the uh, and the king, and that's it. But there is way more than that, and not just in terms of feudal versus communal, but even in many other contexts actually. Um, that well, especially at the outskirts of Europe proper, but the still that. You know, we're Middle Ages. Nobody gives a freaking damn about it, despite it's really, literally, one of the most important thing in in the world medieval history, and and that it's not just important because it's just like you know one thing that was you know relatively important chiefly for one place. I mean, it, this was the, the the pivot around which the whole medieval civilization revolved around. 
and this is important to understand Wh whichever it is this is not a relativistic statement this is an absolutistic statement this thing is important and everybody should know about this and it doesn't seem everybody gives a freaking damn even in you know it's weird it's weird but this this happens also actually in many other countries even, even feudal Europe is not very much considered I think that um, for example in pop culture the the, the most uh, frequent picture is being given is about kingship really I mean even that the, the part of feudalism that really makes the most but what about really the the very deep and and basic and relations of, of, of the world medieval Europe that are based on, on the local, you know, vassals, etc., and dynamics and chivalry, etc. We haven't looked much of that. You know, usually the, the big thing is that king versus that other king. Um, and, and what about the middle? That is actually the cream, uh, the, the base, the, the, the bulk. Nobody seems to give a damn because the truth is that nobody actually wants or cares to understand the Middle Ages. And, and I'm not saying it because I presume that I'm particularly good at it, but um, but simply because I, I read these things and I say, but, you know, um, and I know why they're not care, you know, why people do not care. Um, and, and I think it's rel it would be relatively easily to re easy to make them care. And that's the reason why I make these videos, because I, otherwise, you know, if I w were to be talking something to everybody does you know what would be the difference and that, that's why instead where I tend to invest in things that nobody cares about <laughs> probably it's not a good idea but th they do not care about because they don't know it exists yet and maybe you know when they discover that they that exists they're willing to learn more about it and, and I hope that that this is the case that that it actually works and perhaps they these things help I realize that most of the videos I make are and that people watch is just about that battle or that you know people that was cool because it flowed or about the tactics etc but this broader picture is is at least what you should get at the beginning of that because and then and just and then that's in fact what we study basically when we start university if you want to become a historian you, you should you're supposed to, to know these things, but sad sadly enough, I would say, even certain uh, national perspectives uh, really tend to be very self-centered. Like, I've been reading many manuals, I, I don't say now from which countries, but, you know, countries that I totally esteem and I, you know, have really nothing about, but I realize, for, and, and this is what kind of, you know, surprised me in a negative way, um, that... Th th there was a, a very heavy shift towards that perspective as if you know you're forming uh, young people that are going to deal hopefully with history Th that's why for example even with the audience I engage into these debates sometimes we're very pleasant by the way because you know I have a very intelligent interlocutors that that uh, on on the topic of generalist um, versus specialist uh, that is not should shouldn't be really versus because I think they should exist at the same time definitely but uh, sometimes uh, what happens dramatically and continuously in every single historical uh, context I see uh, both uh, where I research and then where I uh, you know things I watch even just for entertainment etc that the the world scope is extremely narrow. And that's a real problem, because what's the point of even focusing on one topic if you don't know at a general level, at a basic level, a bit like all the rest? I mean, the basic level, I think it's becoming universities now, things that I personally studied when I was in, you know, like in the fifth grade, <laughs> like, um, I, I uh, and that are extremely abstract like for example one thing that I that I love not just for the Middle Ages uh, but as a historical approach is the idea that I mean let's l have this completion like you know let's see every single corner what what was happening you know it, it's like studying just to make you an example studying 
ancient history concentrating exclusively on the Romans. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate because the Romans are the single most important thing that ever existed in the ancient world, but um, it's it's still, uh, you know, you, you have to know the rest. You know, if anything, you need to know that what the Romans came from, what, what existed before, what existed around. Otherwise, how can you understand their importance in the first place? Well, the Middle Ages it has this much more accentuated because in the Middle Ages you don't really have a center. You can't say that you know this country was actually more important than another in the Middle Ages. I mean, during Roman imperial times, you can't say that Rome was the most important thing up there. Yes, in the Middle Ages you can't say that. What was more important? The Holy Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba, France, England, uh, uh, communal Italy, wh what the Vikings? Wh what what was really more important? You know, it, you, it, it's all relative. There is not one that really stands out like this is literally the most single most important thing that happened. You can make a quest for, like I'm doing, like let, let's look at this perspective and let's observe that is important. But how can you study the Middle Ages if you basically cut off just, you know, three-fourths of it and uh, you concentrate just on the remaining fourth and it doesn't make any sense. It's uh, it's ridiculous, actually, and I can't think of a. Re in fact, I believe that there is a pretty. S I mean, even sometimes I see medievalists who don't. We can't even. We have. We haven't even studied Latin. I mean, now of course depends what, but but no, it it doesn't because even in, in every single moment in the Middle Ages, basically you need at least in the Western one for the Western one. To know Latin. Objectively, you can't study Viking history if you don't know Latin, or if you, you know, it's impossible. And people go out there and say, okay, well, yeah, I get that translation somewhere, but how can you approach uh, a period? And I'm, I'm very, very, very uh, worried about this, because that is, to me, the proof that we don't give a freaking damn about the general dimension. We just think we have to produce in that tiny little thing that you can't say everything like perfectly but that you know for which you don't know much much of the rest so what's the real deal I mean especially if you have to teach to other people you're basically perpetrating a narrow um, perspective of, of what m middle ages really was were and and that's why also and and then you and and then you get this extreme um, contrast between the the hyper specialist and the completely generalist um, and you 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 get lost in the middle like you know more or less how the feudal system worked and then you maybe know how in one tiny little place everything worked like in terms of uh, you know juridical stuff etc and then maybe you don't even you can't even distinguish in fact the importance of framed importance let's say of a of a thing like I don't know the uh, the Angevin Empire, or um, you know th th it's that's really serious and and that's a problem I, I would, I'm I'm really trying to 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 solve in part through these videos in, in my little you know, uh, you know from from my little potential in, in relation to 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 the rest that that all the rest that is out there. But I think it's still worth the pain, and if I can even make uh, a, a little, you know, take a little step further towards that perspective, I think it's fine. But um, I would say you, you can't say that, you know, YouTube is a place where people are meant to 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 look at history in in detail. And in fact, I'm 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 really not making these videos in detail. This is about basic history. Uh, and then, of course, I have my own niche uh, with military history. Sometimes it gets relatively in detail with the many things, but it's it's still the the uh, let's say the, the base that 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 matters and that should be considered that we really don't uh, usually at least. So I think that um, when when I see, however, that that was the point I wanted to make that. The only single person 
that talks about what I'm talking right now in videos like this one is me out there for which nobody ever even considered communal civilization there's not even a single video themed like that uh, named like that well then I say it's good that I'm making these videos and it's embarrassing now because now I've made kind of like I don't even know how many like 15 of them <laughs> and, and and the rest is zero so basically if anybody gets to know these things and searches for them on the YouTube be it, that's it's me the only person that talks about this it's pretty weird um, but it's better than nothing still <laughs> that's why I do it um, all right um, so um, talking about the origins before we said the 10th century is particularly important for many reasons for the the rise of importance of the bishops for the economical rise of the cities we if, uh, see for example this mm, from the private documentation of the 10th century that the Milanese merchants invested their um, gains in 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 land estates so this was literally you know what in two centuries it will become the largest city in Europe and you find in fact in some of the most uh, some of the richest actually and probably the richest too uh, at the time for sure um, into which here we are in the 10th century so in a moment in which uh, uh, you know the, the standard picture is you know hungers Vikings and Saracens reigning from everywhere massacring well these Milanese uh, merchants invest in landed property outside the city walls so this tells you that probably have to rewrite a little bit the picture and and I think the 10th century in fact is a dramatically overlooked century in, in European history um, need to be uh, reconsidered very thor um, thoroughly and and with great great attention um, uh, at the same time always in this Milanese docu docu uh, documents we find that great landowners uh, lived preferably within the city walls rather than in their large um, uh, agrarian companies in their farms in their large farms so this is also important because those are those guys we were talking about before that maybe were great landowners who start coming to live in the city as well and for reasons that appear to be chiefly economical not because the the countryside had become a, a insecure I mean uh, the not safe let's say so in conclusion looking at this very articulated social composition of the cities together with the permanence of economical interests of the citizens I in the countryside you you can observe the 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 first and most important characteristic of this especially of this Italian reality that um, is important in European history because starting from the 12th century will definitely bring to change uh, a lot uh, both economically because much of trade uh, European trade passes through there um, juridical we've seen it more people need uh, all these transactions need people to write to count to account to 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 sign documents etc in the 12th century there are cities to take arms against the Holy Roman Emperor and are even able to defeat him and and the whole balance between Europe and the Mediterranean changes because of this um, and uh, last but not least you have these cities that expand within their traditional uh, boundaries uh, they are able to pr project the the urban control over the territory and you will have in a couple of centuries basically regional states rising on that base so this is of dramatic importance and and, and these reasons would 
serve alone just to explain why we need to talk more about this because this is really something that changed the face of history at so many levels I mean just think if you know what would have happened if the Holy Roman Empire had managed to, to control uh, the Italian Peninsula and uh, get into the Mediterranean for real managing to seize Constantinople a completely different history that changed because of this phenomena uh, some say for, for the worst, um, maybe, actually I'm quite sympathetic towards the, the Ghibelline cause overall, but it's also, no, it was ba basically, as we were saying before, medieval history is the history of a mutual and reciprocal and constant uh, prevarication. Right, you know what what was what emerged in, <laughs> in strictly civil terms mostly emerged from from a from a balance of powers, not not really because you know someone was so fr friendly with with someone else and um, and civilization stems from this world. I mean, the, the the last and biggest reason is that that world we just described would produce the Renaissance, that is modern Europe uh, at so many levels and. It's um, uh, it, it, that there are many other aspects of this that really go beyond. Maybe we will discuss in some other on some other occasion. But you know, um, I don't know if you ever read sources from this. Uh, for for example, for from from uh, urban chronicles, from citizen chronicles, they're dramatically important. Beautifully, um, you know, they they show you the progress of this civilization. I mean, you see that there are literal stages in which, you know, nobody. I mean, that there wasn't even a cer a different way of ch of of thinking that emerges. You know, th there is a great difference that that starts in, in a, f a very few time. That you know, first chronicles were something like written by priests, by the clergy, by the clerks. Like you know, this year, uh, this king died. This other year, I don't know. There was this battle, li literally like this. Then you find uh, a generation afterward. Well, maybe not a generation, but let's say uh, two or three generation afterwards. A um, citizen that is a layman that writes, that writes in a less, much less didascalic way than, than the clerk as well. So these guys are ultra educated. They write the history of their own city, like saying, okay, this year, this began for this reason, and I've heard from this person that it was like that, but that guy comes, and it, it's something dramatically critical, insightful, intelligent. And, and, and what is amazing here is that it, it literally changes in a very few time. I mean, the transition in historiographical schemes, etc., it's relatively slow. But for example, just people writing a chronicle in 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 in, verna in, in ver vernacular language in certain regions is something that happens literally from a day to another. And and the amazing thing is that you realize that they were bilingual at at least in in the measure that. <coughs> Excuse me. Nobody before had ever thought to write in vernacular down because um, it seemed to be to you know they could write Latin at the same time. So why would would writing in vernacular? Because by the way, there is a need now to be understood even politically by the rest of the citizenry to 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 comment on political and military affairs, um, and um, and therefore this language emerges now because it's needed. But it happens in a way that makes you understand that they already knew it before, they knew already knew how to do it before, but they willingly choose this. And for example, th this is also the history of language is particularly important because very the. There are very different different contexts in this sense. For example, in France and Germany, um, vernacular languages are written pretty, you know, down pretty early in time, because these were regions that were less Latinized, um, especially northern France and obviously Germany, um, and they and therefore they, went, they had their oral tradition. They learned to write, and therefore they don't give much damn about Latin. So they kind of write down their language initially. What do you find in a country, for example, like Italy, that we have concentrated on today, is that instead this permanence of Latin is much longer. And it's not because those people actually spoke Latin up to that time. We we know that it wasn't the case. Um, 
transition came, you know, much earlier, many centuries before. Um, what happened there is that, in fact, there is this willing choice to change it with a vernacular that, by the way, already written down was basically almost the same vernacular spoken, I mean, in modern Italian, basically. And it's it's already formed. And it's a, a dramatically more developed language, for example, the vernacular French or German at the same time. And that tells you that, that how much in history certain um, things are actually hidden. And you have to guess the reason, you have to understand the reason, and uh, maybe we'll make a video on this specific topic because I studied these things when I studied um, especially paleography. And, and and they and uh, certain subordinated exams that that really showed you how you know all these problems of registers. I mean, what what is that you have to t talk about? And and what is interesting is, is exactly this thing is that where you realize that communal civilization when it starts writing in vernacular, for example, is is literally the most advanced language that exists out there. Obviously, these guys knew how to write write uh, Latin better and more complexly than in other places but you know if you take for example chronicles even from two different areas of europe regions of europe you take for example flemish chronicles and italian chronicles let's say in the 14th century i mean it seems that flemish chronicles are like one century backwards and it, it's impressive because uh, after all they're, they're f fairly comparable um, regions and, and yet there was a massive difference in, in the level of development and you see it from there so not considering this stuff is blah I mean what you study Middle Ages for uh, if you don't like this or if you don't think it's important um, but whatever we will definitely have time to address this hopefully so in any case this very brief thought transformed itself into my usual endless rant um, but I think it's productive and I hope, as we were saying before, in this way to expand further my uh, knowledge of the matter around. I mean, uh, at least, you know, uh, making people aware that, that, that these problems do exist. Yes, there are people like us that even pose ourselves such problems willingly. And, um, and hopefully making a change because otherwise I wouldn't be here right all right so i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye